Oh, I guess. I guess it's automatic. Yes, I don't need to do that. Mm -mm. Welcome everyone, whoever's here so far. We'll get started in about four minutes, I would say. Give people time to get on. Hi, Emma, welcome. I'm glad that you were able to join us. Hi. Thanks for having me. We were sitting around a table talking about all the different people. Um, <clears throat> And we were talking, we mentioned you and, and everything that we read about you and your criteria. And we we're like, oh, I hope she says yes. <laughs> it's so different, you know, the, the analysis part of it and, and whatever. It's just, it, it's a nice addition. So thank you. Thanks. And Scott, we haven't met, but I look forward to meeting you in person one of these yeah, days. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I would have loved to have met, but could not skip this conference for couple reasons so. yeah no problem i'm in the library all the time one of my favorite places to be i'll see well, you. that's good to hear i'm I'll there. Track you down <laughs> I, I, i'm there sometimes you might see me in custodian custodian mode <laughs> so i might be in a hoodie or gloves <laughs> but i'm i'm usually there i'll look for you we're just waiting for one more panelist. We, they were on at six, so I'm sure that the link is good. <laughs> Emma, you had no problem getting back on with the same link, correct? No. Okay. Or no, I didn't have a problem. Yes, correct. Okay. <laughs> I feel confident she was here at six. <laughs> so she'll be here at 30. Yep. Did she, did she oh, we already have a hand raised in the in the gallery. We haven't started, so I'm gonna take it. Hi, Margaret. Hi, I just wanted to make sure that you knew I was here. <laughs> yeah, we can see all the attendees. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Will we be taking questions from the yeah. gallery? No, okay. No, <clears throat> you guys can make up your own. It's kind of a converse, more conversational. And Scott, any questions you come up with? that lead you. from one to the other. <clears throat> oh, wait, what did I just do? I just saw her. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Claudia, once you and I say hello, we're off. You're going to oh, close our- Stop our videos, yes. And we won't, the boxes won't be there and all that we won't, exactly. we won't be on the screen. Perfect, okay. thank you. <clears throat> and if you are, I'll remove you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I uh, can't. Share. Okay, let me make you hold on. I have to make you the co host again. Okay. <laughs> Great. All right. And we're going to get started. Um, good, e good evening, everybody. I'm Claudia Silk from the Fairfield Public Library. I'm an adult services librarian. And we're so pleased to be partnering with the League of Women Voters of Fairfield on tonight's program, Dis Disinformation, Threats to Voting and Democracy. The League and the library share a mission to inform and educate, and we're so glad you could join us tonight. I would now like to turn it over to Bryce Perry, co-president of the League of Women Voters of Fairfield. 
Thank you, Claudia. <laughs> Excuse me. And thanks again to the Fairfield Public Library for collaborating with the League on another great program. This is such a great partnership. Um, the League of Women Voters is an organization of women and men, Democrats, Republicans, and independents that promotes education and participation in all things related to our democratic process. A discussion of disinformation and its impact on voting and democracy certainly fits the bill. We have an exceptional panel of experts this evening, and I thank them all for joining us today and accepting our invitation. This promises to be a very interesting discussion. I would now like to introduce and thank tonight's moderator, Mr. Scott Jarzombek. I knew I was going to stumble. Okay, I just okay. knew it. <laughs> Scott is the town librarian for Fairfield. He's also an adjunct lecturer at the University of Albany's College of Emergency Preparedness, Homeland Security, and Cybersecurity. That's impressive. That's a mouthful. Um, Scott was named uh, an outstanding librarian by the New York State Senate in 2021. We're really pleased to have you, and thanks again for agreeing to present and moderate. Um, welcome, Scott. I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, just to kind of set the stage, TIFF's information is the deliberate spread of false or misleading information, often with the intent to deceive or manipulate. It can spread through a variety of channels, including social media, news outlets, and even word of mouth. Uh, disinformation can have a significant impact on elections. For example, it can be used to sway voters' opinions, suppress voter, voter turnout, and even interfere with the voting process. At first, we saw this have an impact on national elections, but as time has gone on, we've seen it happen at an alarming trend in local, local and municipal elections as well. There are a number of legal challenges to disinformation. In the United States, for example, there are laws against false advertising and electioneering communications. However, these laws can be difficult to enforce, and they may not be effective in preventing the spread. Simply, Share, the sharing of our political differences was once sometimes enjoyed at our Thanksgiving table. It was once said to be an indicator of a healthy democracy. Disinformation has now taken those differences and stoked a fire in that discourse, dividing friends, families, and at times bringing individuals to physical violence. And with that, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Emily Steiner, it's, she is Common Cause's disinformation analyst. She tracks ongoing trends in disinformation related to voting rights and democracy, and uses that analysis to pressure social media platforms to limit the spread of harmful messages that discourage voters or undermine the integrity of our elections. Before joining Common Cause, Emma earned a master's in art, of arts in Russian, Eurasian, and East European studies from the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. She is from Houston, Texas, and we are very excited to have her. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I'm just going to share my screen real quick um, and get this presentation going. Let's see. So I'm going to talk about stopping cyber suppression and uh, what we mean by that um, in election disinformation. Oops, that is the wrong presentation. I'm going to be talking about election and voting disinformation and uh, what we do at Common Cause to stop the spread of cyber suppression and prevent people from interfering with the voting and elections process through disinformation. So again, I'm Emma Steiner. I'm the disinformation analyst at Common Cause. Um, Scott broke it down uh, about what disinformation is, but I want to highlight that there are other forms too. Um, there's misinformation, which is when people share uh, wrong information unintentionally. That's something like if someone is giving polling hours and they say the wrong hours, but they were mistaken, or if they have inaccurate captions or information about something, but they aren't trying to actually interfere with someone's vote. Um, that can be a common form of uh, what we call information disorder. Uh, there's also malinformation, which is uh, real information maliciously shared in an attempt to uh, stoke violence, to um, dox somebody, or an attempt to gain from publishing their private information. So that would be like posting someone's address, posting 
their work phone number, um, posting a picture of an election worker with their name, something like that. Um, and then what, of course, the type of disinformation that we're focusing on tonight uh, is election disinformation, which we define as deliberate attempts to use false information to change the participation of voters in elections. So like Scott said, disinformation has been around for a while. Um, it's not a new problem, but social media use has supercharged it. Social media use has grown dramatically among both U.S. adults and uh, youth. And platforms like Facebook and YouTube, where there's this rapid flow of information, uh, remain a widely used news source for people. Um, a growing fraction of people report using social media platforms as their main news source. And so it's a lot easier for people to receive inaccurate and maliciously uh, false information on social media. So what am I talking about when I say there are types of common election disinformation? Um, there are several types that we see every election cycle since we started monitoring a common cause. Um, one would be telling people the wrong election date. Uh, usually this is specific to one group. So every election cycle, we see many people posting saying like Democrats vote on Wednesday, Republicans vote on Wednesday. And you know, they might just be joking, but there's always the chance that someone could see that and, you know, think that it is correct information. Uh, we also see incidents like uh, people posting bogus election rules, um, something that has uh, become even more of a problem as voting processes have changed during the pandemic. Um, first in the 2016 election, um, a recently convicted uh, white nationalist social media influencer falsely claimed that you could text your vote for Hillary Clinton. And um, about 4,000 people did try to text their vote. Um, this was considered you know, voter suppression because people were potentially deprived of their vote through this malicious disinformation that attempted to prevent them from actually going to the polls. Uh, we've also seen instances where people try to capitalize on ignorance about the voting process or confusion about um, how voting works to say like, oh, if it's a mail-in ballot, you need to put uh, this many stamps on it for it to count. Or, you know, if it's, uh, if you're voting and they hand you this type of pin, your vote won't count. Um, so we see a lot of incidents where people try to sort of play on, you know, the fact that it can be different in pretty much every jurisdiction, uh, how people vote, and, um, you know, that there's always people who are going to be susceptible to confusion about that. Um, we also see attempts at voter intimidation. Um, there have been claims that by voting, you may put yourself in danger. This could take the form of people posting on social media that immigration enforcement, um, military, vigilantes, or police officers will be at the polls. Uh, it can take the form of claiming that you may find yourself uh, picked up by a debt collector or on a warrant if you vote. Um, all, all of these are attempts to prevent people from exercising their right to vote. Uh, the two final points are ones that we see probably the most often, which are untrue claims about election integrity and security and untrue claims about results. Um, before the 2020 election, uh, Trump really laid the foundation for false claims that voting by mail was not secure. Um, as the election cycle proceeded, uh, these claims became claims that the entire process was rigged or altered, and then became what we often call the big lie, which is the claim that the 2020 election was stolen. Um, even today, in 2023, we not only see disinformation about the 2020 election, but we've seen in each successive election that these sort of myths from 2020 have persisted and taken new forms as people attempt to mislead others about results of 2021, 2022, and unfortunately, already about 2023, as people began voting once more. Um, all of these work together and are used by uh, bad actors who seek to not only confuse people about the voting process, but potentially deprive them of their vote. So our program at Common Cause is called the Stopping Cyber Suppression Program. Uh, it's an anti-disinformation program that tracks, analyzes, and prevents the spread of disinformation about voting in elections. Although we started monitoring in 2016, we, it really began in earnest during the 2020 election. 
where we launched our social media monitoring program. Uh, our grassroots volunteers uh, have looked in their own organic social media networks for posts about voting in elections that contain viral disinformation. They also were able to use search strings that we used responding to emerging narratives about voting elections that found new narratives that were arising, such as claims that ballots were being thrown out or claims that voting machines were being rigged. Through that, we were able to track where these narratives were coming from, identify their source, and then work as a group to make sure that these narr narratives didn't deprive anyone of their vote or mislead people into thinking that the election system isn't secure. Our volunteers found disinformation everywhere. So the primary networks are on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Nextdoor, and TikTok, but we have seen election disinformation even on platforms like Peloton bicycles where people create election denial uh, courses to bike on. We've seen disinformation everywhere. Um, it's usually organic content, which means it's not ads. It's real people in America posting about elections. And it's primarily from domestic sources. Like I said, um, there are instances of you know, botnets or potentially foreign actors who are talking about American voting in elections, but the vast majority of narratives and posts that we found were from real people in the US, almost all from the right wing, um, spreading this sort of viral disinformation. So in 2022, uh, we really honed and refined our program from 2020 and had uh, trained over 2,000 monitors who conducted over 2,000 hours of monitoring. Uh, they submitted almost 4,000 tips of uh, viral posts on social media and emerging narratives from candidates, posters, influencers, their neighbors, basically anyone who is uh, spreading this information so that we could look at it. Uh, I could figure out uh, what it belonged to like narratively. Uh, we could send information to our election protection coalition that relies on our analysis. Um, we could talk to our platform contacts and see if it was uh, possible to remove or flag a post with information about the voting process. And we were able to work together to create uh, counter speech and inoculation content, meaning that if we see a lot of people claiming that uh, ballot drop boxes are insecure, we can put out the facts about ballot drop boxes and point out the number of states that rely on voting entirely by mail, things like that. Uh, on election day alone, we received almost a thousand tips as new narratives broke and uh, incidents at the polls occurred. Uh, we were able to have almost 200 monitors and youth volunteers work with us, and we were able to spot a lot of uh, new breaking narratives. So I wanted to go a little deep into how election disinformation worked in 2022 to explain what we are going to see not only this year, but in 2024 and how this kind of uh, disinformation catches on. So as some examples, uh, we had election cycle narratives about ballot drop boxes. Uh, there was a movie uh, made by Dinesh D'Souza that claimed that uh, there were quote unquote ballot mules who were um, stuffing ballot drop boxes with uh, dozens of fake ballots in an attempt to rig elections. And so this narrative caught on because it created an easy template to basically blame uh, you know, mysterious figures for election results that people found undesirable. So we saw this sort of vigilantism grow where people attempted to identify people that they thought were uh, participating in criminal activity uh, they also attempted to stake out ballot drop boxes, and they found videos out of context and tried to clip them and show them as examples of criminal acts. And so um, this was an emerging narrative we saw. We also saw people claiming that people shouldn't vote on election day. Um, I, I mean, should only vote on election day and shouldn't early vote. Um, they said that they wanted to overwhelm the system and make sure that um, machines couldn't figure it out. Um, and so we tried to mobilize and respond in response to that to make sure people knew that uh, it's perfectly safe to vote whenever is best uh, suited for you. 
Uh, we also saw claims that administrative errors at the poll were fraud. Uh, this is something that happens every election cycle. Uh, think of the numerous things that happen just in the course of planning an event or uh, undertaking an event, and then imagine uh, you know, how it can be taken in bad faith by malicious actors. And you have a ready set narrative where people can claim that, oh, a polling book going offline is fraud, or a power outage is fraud, or you know, uh, someone handing you the wrong pencil or pen at, at a polling booth is fraud. Um, we saw uh, this then become capitalized on by people like Donald Trump, who said that um, people should protest in response to administrative errors. Um, so that's something that happens perennially is, um, you know, people uh, sort of maliciously interpret uh, election day incidents. Uh, we also saw claims that the results are fraudulent. Um, there are claims that people should not uh, should count every vote and announce the results by election night. Um, that's never been the case because uh, what we see on election night is mostly projections of results. Certification comes much later after uh, ballots received during the grace period are counted and everything is sorted out. Um, but we've seen recent narratives where people claim that anything counted after election night or any result announced after election night is fraudulent. And that's an attempt to capitalize on confusion about voting and an attempt to claim like an early victory. Um, so what we saw in 2022 is that um, all of anything that happens at a polling location, uh, good or bad, can be spun by uh, bad actors to claim that election officials are working against the system. Uh, unfortunately, we saw this on a variety of networks and uh, spread by people with really big platforms. And so, you know, we had blue verified checks on Twitter saying that, um, you know, Mike Lindell was right about those machines. That's someone who makes a lot of false claims about voting machines. Uh, we had Donald Trump saying that this is a scam and voter fraud. Uh, we had a famous uh, former director saying that uh, there was fraud. And there were even people on TikTok saying that the elections needed to be redone. Um, so unfortunately, these narratives tend to take off on an election day and persist in the immediate post-election period. So what are our responses on what people can do to that? Um, I know it can seem pretty disheartening to see that there are so many uh, election disinformation narratives that continue to proliferate. Well, thankfully, there are quite a lot of solutions out there that we have been proposing. Uh, platforms can work to combat disinformation by making sure that there is friction on viral posts. That means uh, making sure in the back end that um, if something is taking off and getting a lot of traction and it's about a disinformation topic, they can sort of apply the brakes on it and make sure that it's not spreading super fast. Uh, we also think platforms should invest in non-English fact checking and moderation um, for communities that are not communicating in English. Um, a lot of non-English disinformation is uh, premised on the same narratives as in English, but uh, doesn't have even a fraction of the resources dedicated to fact checking and moderation. So something we've been pushing for is for um, funding that fact checking and moderation. Uh, we think platforms should stick to their consist to consistently enforcing their existing policies about voting elections. Uh, we also think that they should provide real-time access to data for researchers and watchdogs like us to um, make sure that they are holding to their promises. Uh, we'd also like greater transparency around enforcement. It can be very difficult to figure out what social media platforms are actually doing about this information. And so something that we have been pressuring them on is greater transparency about what they are taking, it, taking down, when they are taking it down, and why. There's also a lot that we can do about this information. Uh, you can always report this information when you see it. And we even have a tip line from Common Cause that lets us know um, on our, our back end if of viral narratives that we may have to debunk or uh, create messaging to inform voters about. But one easy thing that people can do just sitting at home using social media is avoiding amplification. So we ask people that even though it is really tempting to quote tweet, to reshare on Facebook, to post a reply TikTok, something like that, to say that 
someone is saying something very false and wrong, we ask people to not comment, not react, and don't share and debunk when someone is posting disinformation. That's because platform algorithms are value neutral. When they see uh, a lot of engagement around a topic or with a specific post, they say, they think, hey, that's really popular. We're going to show it to more people and we're going to surface it in more feeds. And so a lot of times when people are quote retweeting or resharing to uh, debunk something and say, hey, this is wrong, they're actually making sure everyone can see it, which creates further confusion and uh, creates the possibility of showing it to more voters. And so one easy thing people can do is just do not engage with this information, uh, send it along to us, uh, volunteers, election protection uh, volunteer, um, you know, get involved with posting actual information and making sure people in your community have the proper information about voting elections, but do not try and uh, reshare that disinformation yourself. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, I can put information in the chat or if there's a follow-up email, I can send along some resources. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Emily, thank you so much. And can I just ask like a, a, a couple of questions? I know we're gonna have a Q and A later, but there's a couple of things that came up during your presentation. We have family and friends, people who are who we are close to, coworkers who we share social media platforms with that we're friends with. What do we do when that sister or aunt or cousin or coworker shares disinformation? on a platform, you know, how should we react? What are some ways, should we go into their comments and say, hey, um, you know, Uncle Steve, this is incorrect? Or should we reach out to them personally? I mean, it's, I think this is something a lot of people grapple with. Yeah, for sure. And we grapple with it too, because it's really situation specific. Um, if it's someone that you think is not going to react well, if you post it in their comments, then yeah, you should make sure that you're not escalating the situation by posting something where someone is immediately going to feel defensive. Um, what I would suggest in most cases is to maybe privately message someone, and I've done this before myself, to say, hey, I noticed you were talking about this. I wanted to point to some official resources, like here's a source that I consider reliable and I'm happy to talk more about this and point them to like their secretary of state information or you know, a, a source that most people consider reliable. If it's someone that you feel might not re react um, negatively and that you feel that there is value in posting something where everyone can see it, there are some studies that show that that has some value too. It's called observational correction. And it's, research has shown that when someone corrects a wrong fact in view of other people on social media, the people who read it uh, have more resilience to the disinformation and remember the fact check. So it's really situation specific and it depends on how well you know the person and how they're going to react. And then putting on my librarian hat, um, there is now a lot of questioning of fact checkers. There's a lot of uh, distrust in expertise. How do you work around that? I mean, it's great to share these resources, but I can almost guess what the reaction of some of my patrons and some of my friends would be when I shared some of this information. So that's something that's also kind of difficult to grapple with and something that we're still working on are, you know, resources for addressing. But I will say that when it's family and friends or someone you know or have a relationship with, sometimes pointing to other people in the community who you know to be reasonable or sources of trust and information uh, can help. And in some instances, that may be a local business leader. It may be a local politician that people feel positively about just someone in your community that is more of a trusted source of information. And that might be easier to tell some skeptical people to rely on um, more than something that they may consider, you know, less personal, like a fact-checking website. Thank you so much. And please stay for the Q&A. Don't go anywhere. Um, but it was a fantastic presentation. Really appreciate it. Uh, and I'm going to introduce, introduce our next speaker. We do only have two speakers tonight. Uh, we did have one drop out, which is a shame, but I think it'll facilitate. We'll have a little bit more time for a more in depth conversation at the end of these uh, fantastic presentations. Michaela Pandothrothna 
How did I do? Oh, okay, thank you. Is counsel with the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU Law, where her work focuses on election security, election reform, governance, and combating misinformation. She was previously a litigator with Earth Justice and a fellow with the Natural Resources Defense Council. She has authored and co-authored several reports and articles on the topics of misinformation in elections, democracy, and the environment, and her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, NBC News, and elsewhere. Um, I'm That's impressive. Both your bios are impressive, so I'm just going to hand it over to you, Michaela. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, so mis- and disinformation can in fact, a broad range of topics, um, but at the Brennan Center, like Common Cause, we have a special focus on elections and voting and the ways that mis- and disinformation affect democracy. Um, election misinformation typically includes false and misleading information about the voting process and election administration. And people can spread misinformation about elections and voting to try to deceptively trick people out of voting, as we heard, or to sow cynicism and distrust in the electoral process. Um, it's really important to note that mis- and disinformation isn't a new phenomenon. It's been a longstanding problem in the election space in particular. We've always had bad actors who try to trick people out of voting by spreading false information about how to vote, when to vote, and where to vote. Unfortunately, it's part of America's um, not so storied history of vote suppression. Um, elections can be a hotbed for misinformation, and one of the reasons that misinformation can thrive in elections is because the demand for accurate information sometimes exceeds the supply of it. Um, as you may know, election systems in America are highly decentralized, so how you vote will depend to some extent on where you live, and states are in charge of running their own elections, typically county and local election officials oversee polling places and coordinate poll workers. And all of this leaves plenty of room for confusion and misstatements um, and really an environment that's prone to both producing misinformation that's sort of genuinely spurred by confusion or being exploited by bad actors who um, use this confusion to spread disinformation. But we are in this new landscape now where false claims about the 2020 election have seized and distorted the election conversation and are undermining confidence in the integrity of the vote um, in a really unprecedented way. Um, you know, we've seen that trust in elections has plunged among some segments of Americans. We um, just last week, I think, put out a poll showing that election officials have left their posts in huge numbers after the 2020 election. Um, this survey of local officials, which we conducted in partnership with the Medicine Strategy Group, found that 12% of local election officials began their service after the 2020 election cycle, and another 11% of current officials say that they are very or somewhat likely to leave before November 2024. And this has really been spurred by an extraordinary series of attacks and threats against election officials um, and their safety as a result of disinformation spread about the um, 2020 election. This exodus of election officials has drained critical expertise from the field of elections. Elections are incredibly complicated to administer, so experience really matters in this field. And um, you know, we should all be worried about the fact that um, our election offices have sort of less experience than they than they had in the past. Um, and this problem is compounding. The draining of experience and expertise makes it more difficult for election, offic election offices to combat election misinformation. Um, and that in turn is creating vacuums that could result in an influx of election deniers into election offices. Um, in fact, election denialism did infect races for office with power over elections in 2022, with dozens of candidates across at least 18 states embracing false claims of a stolen 2020 presidential election. Um, these candidates were, by and, uh, by and large, roundly defeated in the midterm elections, which was really sort of a, a resounding rejection of election denialism in some ways. 
but their messages were still um, influential and they encouraged and they still encourage voters to make sinister assumptions about American elections. We have also seen since 2020 in this, again, this unprecedented moment, um, a really um, large wave of restrictive voting laws that have been passed. Um, so the Brennan Center as an organization has tracked laws that both restrict and expand access to the vote for over a decade. And we found that since the beginning of 2021, states have passed um, this unprecedented spate of laws that restrict voting, including many that were in effect for the first time in the midterm elections. Some of these laws impose harsher ID requirements for voting. Some make it substantially more difficult to vote by mail, um, increasing, um, uh, sorry, dramatically reducing dropbox numbers or making, making it harder to register for vo to vote. Um, and increasing other challenges for voters who are voting in person on election day. Um, so you may have seen some coverage of this phenomenon, but what has received relatively less attention is the direct connection between um, the disinformation campaign that was conducted um, both in the lead up and in the aftermath of the 2020 election and this extraordinary wave of restrictive voting laws across the nation. During and after the 2020 election, the Trump campaign filed a suite of lawsuits all across the country to challenge the election results. Um, the campaign and its allies consistently lost those cases. Um, in fact, at least 38 Republican appointed judges shot down cases in this vein. But the Brennan Center's research has shown that the specific false claims that provided the scaffolding for these failed lawsuits in individual states often resurfaced and later underpinned particular provisions in restrictive voting laws and bills in those same states. So we've said that these laws perpetuate a sort of disinformation feedback loop. They're fueled by misinformation and they also create an added risk for misinformation. Um, one sort of illustration of this, somebody who has experienced this directly, the president of the Florida Supervisors of Election told the House Oversight Committee in Congress last year that, and I quote, the dialogue of the legislative debates over election laws, as well as the passage of the bills has magnified the belief in misdis and malinformation and made the task of restoring voter trust in the elections process much more difficult. Um, the president of the Texas Associ Association of Election Administrators similarly noted that during state legislative debates over election law changes in Texas, quote, public testimony frequently included broad generalizations of alleged fraud during the conduct of elections and by mail ballot, purported violations of the election code, interference with poll watchers, and repeated misleading information about actions taken by the Harris County clerk responsible for the November 2020 election. Um, in many cases, new restrictive voting laws target or disproportionately impact Latino and Black voters. And our research has also found that newly registered voters are most likely to be Latino and are at special risk for misinformation stemming from information gaps. Um, and at, at the same time, this disinformation in Spanish can be particularly virulent and differ in certain dimensions from English and language dis disinformation. Uh, so spread disproportionately on platforms like WhatsApp, where it is harder to track because a lot of that um, is in private conversations. Another group that is at risk uh, um, are new citizens who may be unfamiliar with the voting process. Um, and they are, again, at special risk from misinformation that stems from information gaps. Uh, now, in terms of solutions, um, we did tracking of election misinformation on major media platforms around the midterm elections that we used to put out some data-driven recommendations about how election officials, social media companies, and civic groups can address and combat mis- and disinformation. So um, in the lead up to the midterm elections between mid-August um, and the end of November after the midterm elections, um, a team of analysts at the Brennan Center read through thousands of social media posts captured by a tool called the Midterm Monitor 
and also conducted an automated analysis of tens of thousands of posts. And one of the patterns that we found was that there were several recurring misinformation themes that um, repeated across election cycles. Um, and because of these recurring core misinformation themes, false claims around mail ballots, voting machines, vote counting, and so on, um, what we um, sort of suggest is that officials and organizations can more effectively and efficiently pre-bunk around common recurring misinformation tropes. So social media companies and election officials can do educational work around explaining existing election security safeguards, the reliability of voting and vote counting machines, the trustworthiness of mail ballots, and the timeline for counting votes and certifying elections. Um, journalists can report additional well-contextualized stories on voting machines, mail ballots, and election results early in the election cycle, and civic groups can also facilitate digital literacy trainings that really prepare voters to recognize these common conspiracy themes. Um, despite coming under attack in recent years, as I have described, um, election officials are still highly trusted, relatively speaking, across the political spectrum by both Democrats and Republicans, actually. So they are critical messengers on these issues. And um, in, in past election cycles, some election offices did give the public early information that helped to pre preempt core misinformation themes and they offer somewhat of a roadmap for other officials who are grappling with this problem of election misinformation. Um, for example, a head of the election, a Michigan County clerk, posted a video to Twitter to explain the vote counting process to the public. Um, in Ingham County's Bob Byram, Barb Byram acknowledged that some voters had expressed concern that um, tabulators can switch votes, but she reassured her constituents that the vote counting process was safe and secure and explained security measures in place to protect the integrity of the vote. Uh, the Ohio Secretary of, of State's office published a video titled Cycle Rose, The Life of an Absentee Ballot to explain the process of printing, mailing, and counting absentee ballots, really showing the public professional election workers at work. And some offices in Texas invited the public to participate in accuracy testing for voting machines that was supervised. Um, in Tarrant County, for example, voters could run in-person and absentee ballots through vote, vote counting machines to witness an accurate count again in a supervised environment. Our tracking of election misinformation um, in the midterms also showed that, some dis that the dis dissemination of some election lies and falsehoods really clusters around several online communities and important influencers. Um, so we recommend that social media platforms push back against networks that peddle misinformation. They can use network analysis to track trends and early indicators of harm and amplify content from state and local election officials. When an isolated election issue, issue occurs that threatens to spur widespread misinformation. Um, we saw this in Maricopa County um, where there was an election glitch that really ignited a firestorm of false claims, um, but was quickly resolved. Uh, social media platforms should slow down related shares until information can be checked for accuracy. And when a local election issue, uh, issue metastasizes into a full-blown national disinformation campaign as occurred in Maricopa County, as, as I mentioned, um, platforms should amplify corrections from state and local election officials so that they break through information silos. Uh, last year, we also published a report titled Information Gaps and Misinformation in the 2020 Election. And in that report, we gave a number of additional re recommendations to election officials to help educate voters. Um, we recommended that election officials conduct timely voter education campaigns and maintain frequently asked questions and rumor control pages where possible to provide an accessible, um, clear, and proactive set of information to voters. Um, and more generally, I would say a whole of society approach is really needed to combat election misinformation. So the news media, including ethnic and regional media, 
can provide contextualized information for common glitches or expected changes. It can be very helpful in mitigating the misinformation risk. Community and civic groups like the League of Women Voters are, of course, critical. They can act as bridges between vulnerable communities, officials, and the media. Um, and, you know, my final recommendation for an individual voters will echo some of what Emma um, talked about earlier. But, but when you see information that seems off or particularly emotionally charged in some ways, you can try to get better context from authoritative and trusted sources like election officials, but also um, established news outlets and trusted community organizations. If your community has a trusted local newspaper, that can be a good source of information um, because again, a lot of election information is very, very localized. Sometimes it might make sense to refer to an independent fact-checking website like Polifact to verify um, to see if what you're reading online is true. Um, and again, to echo Emma, best practice is generally to not amplify misinformation by reposting it online, but consider reporting it to the social media platform or search engine if that's you know, appropriate in the context or even connecting one-on-one -on -one with friends and family to give them accurate information when they've been exposed to election falsehoods. Um, so again, I, I think my big big takeaway would be that this is something that will require every segment of society um, from uh, officials down to community organizations, down to the individual um, voter and friends and family. Um, and uh, it's really sort of critical for the entire ecosystem um, to, uh, to come together to um, to address this this problem. Ella, thank you so much. And before I bring Emma back into the conversation, what we often hear is that there's a First Amendment right to, you know, to social media, you know, not understanding kind of what those platforms mean. And how do we react to that? How do we react to you know being told that by reporting somebody, you know, we're infringing upon their First Amendment rights? And what does the legal landscape for that look like? What's a, an explanation that we can use? Uh, sure. I mean, I I would say um, typically the I, I, the First Amendment um, would only be relevant in the context of the government acting, and so um, an individual reporting. Uh, false information to a, a private social media platform uh, should not implicate any First Amendment concerns whatsoever. So you would just say it's a, it's a poor framing of what the First Amendment really means? Uh, it is, um, you know, I, I would say it doesn't, it doesn't Im implicate First Amendment concerns, but I, I, um, I understand that, that when people are raising it, they're talking about sort of free speech principles more broadly. So I wouldn't be dismissive of their, um, what is I think at the root of what, what they're talking about, just, you know, because I, I think it's always best to engage with people um, in an earnest way that sort of, you know, uh, treats them with respect. But um, in terms of the First Amendment specifically, uh, it shouldn't apply in that, in that context. So uh, for both you and Emma, you know, the first question that comes to mind, and hopefully I'm not going to get myself in trouble with this question, but is there actually political will in the United States to enact any tangible legislation that would take on the information, you know, the, the, um, the topics that you brought up? I mean, is there anything out there right now? Are there elected officials that are, you know, that, you, that we should look more into? And is there really going, to, you know, can we create some framework of laws that protect our democracy from this? I'd say it's an, it, the way I've seen it talked about a lot and um, particularly in our election protection coalition is as an issue that can be attacked from a number of fronts. So not only does that include um, potentially legislation that provides more funding for local news and making sure that there aren't news to deserts or those information gaps that Michaela talked about, but making sure that 
maybe plat platforms can't collect as much uh, private information and data that they can use to target populations and um, potentially surface content that is incendiary to them. So you can come at it from a number of angles, whether it's funding local news, um, privacy legislation, um, things like uh, protecting election workers from harassment and intimidation. Those are some laws that have really gotten a lot of traction in the past few years. Um, I think there's a number of ways that, uh, you know, rather than trying to say, uh, solve the issue with one discrete like piece of legislation, um, we're able to sort of chip away at it from a number of fronts. And I'm sure Michaela knows like all the legislation that's being proposed to deal with that. <laughs> Oh, I mean, I would, I would just add. Um, I think Emma gave a sort of great summary. Um, uh, there, it, um, you know, among the most sort of promising pieces of of legislation to kind of target disinformation specifically, at least at the federal level, um, are uh, legislative provisions that would. Um, address disinformation that can lead to vote suppression. Um, and uh, so, so that is something that has certainly gotten some support and traction um, in Congress. And I would say also transparency is a really critical component. Um, we just don't know so much about what is happening on the, the major social media platforms and about the strategies that they um, are using to to address mis and disinformation, and um, so passing strong um, transparency legislation that sheds light light on this issue, I think, is is critical. Do you think it would be more effective at a state level or a federal level? Uh, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, speaking generally that um, actions need to be taken at the, both at the state and, and federal level um, and, and both are valuable in different ways. And is there some examples internationally or what are other nations doing that maybe we can look towards as a model of taking on disinformation um, and then maybe we can see some hope from it. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I would say that, that Europe um, has, uh, has much stronger sort of regulations around transparency again um, than, than America. There are, um, it is sort of a, a different environment in terms of the the First Amendment, um, the First Amendment sort of place in American jurisprud jurisprudence. Um, but uh, you know, um, Europe has also um, taken more steps in terms of of uh, looking at how to how to regulate around AI, which could be potentially a huge problem for, for disinformation. Um, Emma, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I just um, second what you're saying, which is that you know over and over in tech spaces, you see people pointing to European legislation as a potential model. But again, we keep running into you know the, on the one side, it's a fantastic uh, thing to have. But on the other side, it's hard to legislate around the First Amendment. So. Um, you know, there are ways we can try and make those solutions more workable in the American context, but at the end of the day, it's going to require, um, you know, increased transparency from platforms, it's going to require more funding of local news, it's going to require also uh, increased, uh, um, you know, platform enforcement against disinformation, and, you know, unfortunately, that can be kind of hard to do because a lot of it is requiring social media platforms to play ball and play along. And, you know, that leads back to the idea of social media platforms. They're, they're, that's, that is a money-making enterprise. That is a business. And now we're, you know, talking about legislation of businesses and those algorithms. You, you know, you touched on the algorithm. We joke about the algorithm in libraries all the time. 
that makes a company money or at least makes investors money back from their investment. Um, what is a avenue that we can take to talking to these platforms, especially when a platform like Twitter has been taken over by a billionaire? Um, how do we talk to them and talk to them about um, the importance of accurate information? And what, you know, can you touch on the, the laws or the changes in laws that make them less responsible about what they put out? I think I could tackle one part of that, um, not so much the, the legal side of things, but I, I can say that in my experience at Common Cause, um, working to hold platforms accountable, we have found that when we have an existing relationship with policy staff at platforms, we have found them responsive in some instances. One of our biggest successes in 2022 was getting Meta to change the rules around harassment and intimidation of election workers. They previously did not have a rule uh, preventing uh, posts from uh, harassing, intimidating, bullying election workers uh, from being uh, enforced. But um, we were able to show them and pressure them with, uh, you know, not only uh, internal correspondence, but um, media pressure that, you know, this is a problem that is not going to go away and that it is affecting people in the community who rely on social media to get out information about elections. And so we were able to get a rule established that made uh, harassment and intimidation of election workers on the platform, something that was enforceable. So we do have some successes to point to, but uh, at the end of the day, when it comes to legislating against big tech, I, um, you know, I, can, I uh, am unable to think of a, you know, one, one size fits all solution for that issue. Uh, yeah, I would, I would just echo um, what Emma says there there are some sort of legal barriers I think that you you touched on um in terms of uh shields that protect um companies from um being sued for a publication of uh third party content uh but you know, I, I would say it's really critical for the companies to hear from um, particularly sort of grassroots civic groups that have um, connections on the ground. And, um, and, and I think that demonstrating the, the real ways in which disinformation is um, causing tangible harm to, to communities um, is is extremely important because uh uh larger larger groups um you know may have um a sort of uh, more of a a direct connection but but grass, grassroots groups can really sort of um provide the stories about um about what's what's really happening um out there and i think that's a really important part of the equation you mind if I jump in and ask a question? <laughs> um, coming from the grassroots, coming speaking from the League of Women Voters perspective, um, we're a nonpartisan organization that's been around for a long time, and we focus on get out the vote. We register voters. We put out voters' guides. Um, we do debates and legislative forums, and we are governed by rules of nonpartisanship that are are very very strict you can't have a democrat speak without a republican you we're very fair equal time and whatever um but we're but chasing the truth trying to find the truth behind this disinformation kind of sets everything askew um we're kind of coming up behind it and I want to talk about success in changing people's minds. We, we're doing the same things we've done before with getting information out there, having forums like this, present programs and presentations like this. Um, but are we are we preaching to the choir? You know, are the, the people that that tend to join or listen or read the voters got well, that, that might be a different example. Um, how do we ch change somebody's mind? How do how do we as as a, a respected kind of ground grassroots organization 
stop chasing and try and get in front of it um, with success. And people that don't want to listen say that we've become partisan. Um, and like I said, we really, really are, are, are tough keeping that stand. But um, how do we, even as, a, as an established organization, get in front of the disinformation and, um, and actually change some people's minds? How's that for? Give me a quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> One weird trick. Um, so that's something that we've been trying to tackle at Common Cause. And the thing that we've had the biggest success with is trying to teach people, um, not only through the thousands of monitors that we've trained, but trying to teach everyone that we've trained in, in various webinars and presentations that we do, how to become their own trusted source for people. Because uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, people have their own uh, sources of information that they trust more than perhaps CNN or Reuters or PolitiFact. And so, you know, it can really make a difference if you are that trusted source in your community. If someone who is otherwise maybe totally politically conservative and maybe thinks that you're kind of a weirdo hippie who is <laughs> talking about voting all the time, uh, knows that you can be relied upon to know the polling hours or to know, hey, when do I mail that ballot back? Being able to connect about things like that and posting that information, talking to people, letting them know that they can come to you for that information is really important and helps change minds. Um, we held, held a webinar before the holidays uh, on how to talk to your friends and family about disinformation. And we got really good feedback from that because people felt that they needed to be equipped for these conversations with their family members around the dinner table on Christmas or during the holidays. And uh, they, they said, you know, thank you for giving me the tools because I'm going to be asked about it and I need to be able to not get defensive and not, you know, be off putting, but to say something that they're going to be able to connect with. And so that's a problem that we're trying to solve. Um, we obviously haven't solved it yet ourselves, but um, that's something that a lot of groups are starting to focus on now, I think, is trying to teach people to uh, connect in their community and make themselves that trusted source. Um, like Michaela also said, I uh, think that there have been instances of people, um, uh, people's minds being changed by increased transparency. We've seen a lot of positive feedback from things like machine tests that are public or uh, election officials saying like, hey, I'm here for an open forum, come ask me anything. And you know, while that does have its potential drawbacks, um, there are instances where people show up, they see how it works and they say, oh, it's a lot safer than I thought, or I feel reassured now. And so, you know, there are ways you can sort of dislodge that, that belief. Thank you. Uh, one other thing I would add to that, um, cosine <laughs> uh, everything Emma said, um, but we did some polling um, that we put out uh, with the R Street Institute um, and again done by the Benenson Strategy Group in October of last year um, that showed that when presented with information about existing election safeguards, voters' confidence in future elections increased across the board and Republican confidence increased by 21 percentage points after seeing this information. Um, so, you know, there is... Uh, not everybody is going to be moved by this, but there is um, some evidence to suggest that just giving people straightforward information about existing election security safeguards that are in place um, can sort of help bolster their trust in the election process. Um, you know, I, I would say it's um, a, a good idea to kind of steer if you're talking to somebody on the opposite side of the political spectrum who distrusts the election process, it's a good idea to steer clear of um, messages that will, will sort of like raise their partisan flags and shut them down, shut them down to sort of moving forward in the in the conversation. Um, and then, you know, just to echo again what Emma said, I think the messenger matters. Um, we know that uh, veterans, for example, religious leaders are relatively highly trusted, um, you know, by, by Americans. Um, and, and so finding 
um, messengers who um, will have the trust of their their communities is is extremely important. And um, you know, as I as I mentioned earlier, election officials, even though they are um, being sort of threatened at, at the moment and, and attacked by some people, they they still enjoy relatively high levels of trust across the political spectrum. And so they can be effective messengers as well. And emphasizing that local election officials are people who are community members, they're your neighbors, they're your friends is um is important as well in this in this con in this context where um Local, local issues are too often sort of become part of the polarized national debate. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Emma, you, you touched on something that was, that's a question that I have written down. Where does AI and deep fakes play into all of this? How do we prepare ourselves for that with, uh, it seems like, AI is growing exponentially every day. Um, deep fakes are happening. They're funny now. Um, but I think by the time that the next presidential election rolls around, they're really going to be fairly sh sharp and, and put together. So both of you, how, how, what do you see coming? What should people uh, listening or watching this be prepared for? And how do we facilitate a conversation around them? Um, I think with AI and deep fakes, um, you know, it's something that we can't really predict where it'll be six months from now, six years from now. Um, it's already advancing quite fast. Um, and I have seen some pretty convincing deep fakes, even uh, ones of political candidates. Um, you know, that's something that could obviously be an issue. I can only imagine someone, uh, you know, fake conceding or saying only vote for me on election day, don't early vote for me, um, things like that. But I think it still comes down to the same info literacy problem that we've always had, which is um, making sure that people know where they can find reliable resources, making sure that people double check the veracity of videos and photos that they see online. You know, right now it's easy to tell because, you know, the AI people have six fingers or whatever, but it's now it's not going to be like that forever. And so I think just making sure that we sort of hammer home those same, um, you know, fact checking techniques and making sure that people uh, you know, do what we call like lateral research, making sure they find the same fact from a number of different sources and really um, making sure that people can uh, know that like you shouldn't trust what every single thing you see online. Um, same thing that we've been working on for years and probably the same tactics and methods we'll need to use to contend with this issue. Uh, yeah, I, I, um... My view is that um, these rapid rapid advances in generative AI have the potential to transform the disinformation landscape in, in some ways to um, potentially increase the scale of misinformation online, decrease costs for um, disinformation purveyors, um, allow sort of people to yeah, participate in, in disinformation campaigns much more easily, um, and also potentially to generate more convincing um, automated uh, disinformation. And um, in addition to the deep fakes, the language models are hugely concerning from a disinformation perspective as well. Um, and it's not just ChatGPT, a number of other companies are, uh, other than OpenAI are in this space, there are also a number of smaller language models whose um, source code is completely public that can be downloaded and manipulated at the moment. Um, and I, I mean, what the, what the language models kind of do is allow this automated um, uh, spread of, of, of disinformation at, a, again, a, a more massive scale than we've, and potentially in a more convincing way than, than we've seen in the past um, in ways that sort of um, are more uh, tailored to people's informational environments um, 
and uh you know particularly from for um foreign actors that are engaged in disinformation campaigns um this is a, a tremendous worry um and then um it's not just like the static aspect it's the sort of dynamic aspect of um having uh at scale automated conversations um with people through through texts or um uh you know having voice synthesizers um where there's an ai on one end um and the kind of information asymmetry that that could be deployed to um to persuade in a in a way that we have haven't seen before um so i mean i think there's a lot that is uncertain um and uh um there's a lot of sort of humility that needs to be applied in this space in terms of um predicting what will what exactly will happen in the future but um it is concerning enough that i think that um there there needs to be some form of regulation of this um and there needs to be there is a conversation happening around it um but um i think sounding the alarm from the disinformation perspective is is important Thank you. Um, so I want to end with a positive. Um, so Emma, what are some 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 tangible pieces of advice? And I know you did some of this um, in, in your presentation, but something that you know now that, that we're at the end, what are a few pieces of, of, of advice that you have for our attendees, for them that they can use, or they should do, or they should look for walking away from this? Because I do believe many of the people attending this are really they're concerned about it and they want to do something about it. Yeah, well, I'm sure uh, everyone here, if capable, is um, you know registered to vote already, uh, which is the most important thing. But um, I also will link a resource in the chat where people can send along any viral disinformation posts they see about voting in elections. And then I also just want to remind people, you know, not to engage and make the algorithm surface disinformation to more people's feeds. And then also try and figure out ways that you can be that trusted source in your community and amongst your network and amongst people that you know and make sure that you are that reliable person that people come to. And um, you know, every little uh, post that you do in support of elections and with correct information and putting out that pro-voting uh, content and letting people know information really does make a difference and really does help. Yeah, I would say that um, civic organizations um, and particularly grassroots groups are are critically important in this space. And um, again, you know, providing that bridge between local communities, local media, and officials is incredibly important. Um, so, you know, uh, connecting with your local election officials. Uh, giving them sort of information about what is what election topics are proving to be particularly confusing among voters that you're seeing or are, are is potentially leading to misinformation or even just you know general confusion i think is incredibly helpful and then you know being able to provide the bridge in the other direction relaying information back from election offices to to communities and helping in that respect, I think is is really helpful. And then, you know, potentially providing, organizing some, um, uh, or, you know, providing a platform to organize digital literacy trainings um, to people so that they can recognize these common conspiracy themes um, and uh, approach sort of um, information in, in a savvy way online, I think is is very helpful as well. Well, thank you both. Um, probably some of the most impressive guests we've we've had at the library on um, a very important topic. Uh, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for the incredible work they do in both Fairfield and nationally. Throughout my course of my career, no matter where I've been, they've been one of my favorite organizations to partner with. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to the incredible staff at the Fairfield Public Library who not only 
organize fantastic programs, but are on the front line of information science and work to keep information accessible and the distribution of that information equitable in our community. Again, I want to thank our speakers who took the time to present this evening and to discuss such an important topic. And last but not least, I'd like to recognize those of you in attendance. Educating yourself on this topic means you have made the first step in combating disinformation. So thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.